Um, it, it really is my great pleasure to have been asked to talk about a couple of things this afternoon that are really very, very precious to me. Uh, one is uh, the Morrill Act and the land grant movement, because as the Chancellor said, um, although I'm not originally from uh, the US and North Carolina, I have spent uh, nearly all of my uh, professional career at major land grant universities. And of course, the other thing that I'm very passionate about, which is NC State. And so um, it, it's great for me to be able to tie a, a couple of those things together this afternoon and talk about the impact of the land grant movement uh, on North Carolina and the formation uh, of NC State. Okay, the second direction I was given was how to press this button. <laughs> That's also not working. All right, how about I just hit the enter? All right, I remember some things from my old PC days. Okay, um, I thought this uh, quote from Justin Morrell was really appropriate. The fundamental idea was to offer an opportunity in every state for a liberal and larger education to larger numbers, not merely to those destined to sedentary professions, I think he meant provosts and, and <laughs> such, but to those much needing higher instruction for the world's business, for the industrial pursuits and the professions of life. And that was speaking to the Vermont legislature in 1988. So how did North Carolina respond? As was mentioned, the Morrill Act was signed in July, on July 2nd, 1862. And initially, as the Chancellor mentioned, uh, the land script funding went to uh, our colleagues down the road at the University of North Carolina for almost two decades. Uh, but apparently, there was not a lot of instruction actually occurring at the time in agricultural sciences. There were some courses uh, on the catalogs but not a whole lot happening. And so a group of individuals uh, around Raleigh, known as the Watauga Club, as the Chancellor had mentioned, lobbied very, very hard uh, for the formation of a Raleigh-based industrial school. And at the same time, there was a very broad statewide farmers movement that called for a land-grant college to be established separate from UNC. I know you all waited for that part. So on March 1st, 1887, the land script funds were transferred from UNC to a proposed school in Raleigh. On March 3rd of 1887, New College was established using land script funds and funds from the Hatch Act of 1886, which established the North Carolina Agricultural Research Station. And on March 7th, 1887, what we know as Founders Day, legislation enacted creating the North Carolina College of Agriculture and Mechanic Arts. The second Morrill Act, as was uh, mentioned, was August 30th of 1890 and required states provide technical education for African Americans and subsequently was formed North Carolina A&T in 1891. There's been a lot of change since that time. If we look at NC State's enrollment, as the Chancellor mentioned, we started with 72 back uh, in those early days. Uh, enrollment planning was a lot easier in those days. And I'll just bet they did not have the 12 cell matrix. Um, and it has grown dramatically in that time but if you look especially uh, about the time I was born in the late 1950s, uh, we really had still only reached 5,000 total students by that period of time. And of course, the uh, dip that you see here uh, around World War I was when a lot of uh, young men went off to fight in the, World War II, I'm sorry, went off to fight in the war and then the rebound uh, uh, with the uh, the acts afterwards uh, to move those coming back into higher education. We've grown very significantly and very quickly since that time, and now we have a total population of over 34,000 students, including almost 25,000 undergraduate students 
and 9,500 graduate students. I want to spend just a moment talking about the evolution of the colleges here at NC State. Because obviously we started out with the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences, although it wasn't called the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences, I think it was called the School of Agriculture uh, initially. And the College of Engineering, and in fact pretty much every other college that we have has evolved in some way from, from those two colleges. So initially, the College of Agriculture uh, gave rise to the College of Natural Resources, which is uh, originally came out of the Department of Forestry uh, in the College of Agriculture. Uh, the College of Design, uh, people, many people don't realize, had its origins in the landscape architecture program uh, in the uh, School of Agriculture. And of course, uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine had its origins uh, in the Department of Animal Science back in the College of Agriculture. The College of Engineering gave rise to the College of Textiles, and largely, the two colleges together gave rise to the College of Physical and Mathematical Sciences. It's also interesting to note that the other three colleges that we have on campus, Humanities and Social Sciences, Education and Management, all derived significant components from the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences as they evolved over time. As many of you are aware, we're currently undergoing another transition. We are moving components of the biological sciences and combining them with what is currently physical and mathematical sciences to form a new college of sciences effective July 1st of next year. So if you've only been around 20 or 30 years or a few years less in my case, you may have the perspective that the changes that we are undertaking now are, are radical and divergent from our history. But in fact, they're very, very compatible with the way we have realigned our academic programs to take advantages of challenges and opportunities throughout the last 100 years. And I hope that we continue to, rather than see our academic colleges as fixed entities forever, to see them as units which give rise and give birth to other programs that can help us align with the great needs of today's society and tomorrow's challenges. I want to spend a few moments talking about, in fact, boasting about, the land-grant legacy in two or three different ways. First of all, I want to talk about our legacy to our students. You know, in the 2013 edition of U.S. News and World Report, which I'm sure you have all read that best college edition, back to back, we are ranked fifth nationally among public universities in the ratio between quality and cost. And for me, those terms quality, accessibility, and relevancy are absolutely critical in what we do. We rank 18th nationally for graduating students with the least debt. And as the Chancellor mentioned, or perhaps Nevin mentioned, we are for the first time ranked in the top 10 among up and coming schools. There's nothing like being an up and comer after 125 years. But what it does reflect is that university presidents across the country who, who do these rankings recognize those institutions which are making the most promising and innovative changes in academics, faculty, facilities, campus, and student life, and we're in the top 10 of those institutions that they recognize. We try to provide our students with real world experiences, global experiences, such as the thousands of students who study abroad during their undergraduate curriculum. Our global training initiative, our global health initiative, our interactions with the Peace Corps, the Confucius Institute, the Japan Center, our Center for Student Leadership, Ethics, and Public Service, the Prague Institute, our Masters of Global Innovation Management. We provide our students with hands-on research experience in the undergraduate years we have an extraordinary undergraduate research experience and symposium. We provide our students with entrepreneurial experiences. 
Courses, minors, concentrations, we are, as you are aware, developing an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurship living learning village on Centennial Campus and the entrepreneur's garage that Tom Miller is so passionate about developing uh, on our Centennial Campus in conjunction with the Living Learning Village. We provide our students with professional development opportunities, internships, co-ops, leadership programs, leadership development programs, the General Hugh Shelton Center, the Park, the Goodnight, and the Caldwell Scholars Program, and our Career Center. And we try to produce career-ready graduates. In 2010, the Wall Street Journal surveyed 479 recruiters across 30 industries and asked the question, what schools do you most want to or like to recruit graduates from? NC State ranked 19th in the country, 15th in engineering. And one thing that I, I want to emphasize is that while we pride ourselves in producing career-ready graduates, that is not the same as looking at the job opportunities that are available in this state next week or next year and backward engineering our academic programs to try and match those. What this is about and what we are trying to do is produce graduates who will have the intellectual, social, communication skills to be leaders in a global knowledge economy and problem solvers 10, 20, and 30 years from now. And you don't do that by asking what jobs are there next Monday. I want to talk a little bit about our land grant legacy to the state of North Carolina. The first, of course, is to pick up on the fact that we educate more of North, the sons and daughters of North Carolina citizens than any other institution in the state. We have an in-state enrollment of 27,739. We add to that 3,642 out-of-state students and 2,959 international students. We have an amazing Cooperative Extension Program. Established in 1914 under the Smith Lever Act, it serves citizens, businesses, and communities in all 100 counties and the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Nation. It provides expertise from 17 departments in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, three in the College of Natural Resources, the College of Design, and the College of Veterinary Medicine. It has 694 county employees and 287 support staff, 381 NC State University faculty and staff are involved with our Cooperative Extension Service, and 46,000 volunteers annually. It has more than 5 million contacts annually. Our Industrial Extension Service was established in 1955 as the first of its kind in the nation. It was proposed to connect, in much the same way, the NC State College of Engineering to the workplace to help lower costs, better products, and create higher efficiencies. It has expertise across the engineering domains, but also in lean manufacturing, quality improvement, and programs in health, safety, and environmental compliance. In the fiscal year 2011-2012, the Industrial Extension Service had a budget of $11.2 million. The calculated economic impact of that service in this state in that year was $313 million. Now, if you're particularly quick at math, like Dean Solomon over there, you'll realize that that is a return of $27 for every dollar spent through that program, which is an amazing return. It is also oversees the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, NC State Technology Incubator, 
the manufacturing banks at Real Network, and the Minerals Research Lab. I want to boast for just a second about our Centennial Campus. We broke ground on our Centennial Campus in, 18, in 1987, our Centennial year. There are actually two campuses, the main Centennial Campus of a little over 1,000 acres, and the Centennial Biomedical Campus, also referred to as the Vet Med Campus, a little over 200 acres. It's a total of 3 million square feet of constructed space. 62 corporate, government, and nonprofit partners, more than 75 NC State research centers, institutes, labs, and departmental units, and of course, the Lonnie Pool Golf Course. There's 2,760 employees of corporate and industrial partners and institutional partners are on that campus. 1,350 university faculty and staff and postdocs and 3,400 students, and of course 600 middle school students. And my two older sons were a couple of them. And under construction is the amazing new Hunt Library, which will be opened in a couple of months, and a student housing complex, which will feature 1,200 beds uh, on the same oval. An amazing accomplishment in 25 years and indeed one of the most successful university research campuses anywhere in the country. A note that we do refer to it as a research campus and not a research park because it is that interaction between academia, industry, government and public and not-for-profit sectors that is the key. It is not a real estate development. It is about creating an environment that enhances and celebrates that connection. NC State's economic impact on the state of North Carolina is estimated to be approximately $1.7 billion annually. We've spun off more than 90 startups representing $1.5 billion in venture, capital, and 3,000 jobs. There are other examples of our community engagement, however, that may go less notice. The Contemporary Art Museum downtown is a partnership between the Contemporary Art Museum Raleigh Initiative, the Contemporary Art Museum Foundation, and our own College of Design. The Nature Research Center is a partnership between us and other institutions, and the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, particularly with a strong collaboration with our College of Physical and Mathematical Sciences and College of Natural Resources. Our Center for Environmental Farming Systems has led the effort called the 10% Campaign for 10% of food sold through supermarkets and consumed at restaurants to come from local sustainable sources. And just recently, Lowe's Foods reported that in fact they source more than 20% of all of their products from local North Carolina agriculture. Also wanted to quickly mention the Small Business Technology Development Center, which has a potent impact throughout the state, and of course the McKimmon Center for Continuing Education, where we are today. I wanted to talk a little bit about our legacy to the nation and the world. I had mentioned the role that we pay, play in transferring technology, in developing corporations that go ahead and employ thousands of individuals. Indeed, we have 780 active US patents and 230 commercialized products. We are the only university in the country currently leading two National Science Foundation engineering research centers. The Freedom Center, which is focused on re-engineering the, the, the grid, the electric grid in the country, what's called smart grid technology, and the recently funded ASSIST ERC, which is focused on developing self-powered wearable devices for monitoring health and the environment. We have rich examples of interactions with 
the defence area in developing defence technologies. We have strong partnerships with NSA, DOD, and military branches, all focused on the safety and security of our troops. And we've developed other national partnerships and programs, such as the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS, Eastern Regional Division, which is located on our Centennial Campus, and the USDA Agricultural Research Service Food Science Research Unit, which is in our Department of Food Bioprocessing and Nutrition Sciences. The Non-Wovens Institute and Non-Wovens Cooperative Research Center serve the non-wovens industry through both fundamental research and through active program of technology transfer, and quite frankly, has helped lead the resurgence of the textile industry in North Carolina. We have international partnerships. We have more than 280 memoranda of understanding in 60 countries, with institutes in 60 countries. We have recognized that we have to develop deep and rich collaborations at global hubs. And so we're developing strong collaborations through the University Global Partnership Network, where we're a founding member, working side by side with the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, the University of Surrey in England, and Seoul National University in Korea. We've developed strong other partnerships in China and in Europe. So what is the path ahead? Well, it's no secret that I'm pretty excited about the future of NC State. When I look back on the last few years, we have come through a few challenges, particularly budgetary challenges in the last few years. And we have emerged, I think, a strong and focused institution, largely due to the leadership of our Chancellor, Randy Woodson, and to the hard work of everyone in this room and beyond, we have emerged with a very, very focused strategic plan, focused on the success of our students, building faculty excellence and physical infrastructure, promoting, enhancing, and rewarding interdisciplinarity in the way we do all of our work, organizational excellence, and strategic local and global partnerships. I think the time for NC State is perfect. We as an institution are demonstrating that we can have some very, very focused priorities and a willingness to make bold moves to position the institution as we move forward. I can tell you that I'm extraordinarily proud to have spent the last 30 years of my career in major land-grant institutions, but I'm particularly proud to be your provost here at NC State, where I consider to be this, ins this institution to be one of the great land-grant institutions of the country. Thank you very much.